Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles podcast, a talk show that is called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, we cover what's going on in the news, their music, their history, any aspect of the Beatles' careers. We talk about it right here on Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. Some of you might know me for my other uh, Beatles program. Actually, there are two of them. My syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing. And then there's also a talk show podcast on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. I'm being joined by my two regulars on the program. First of all, a man who's been a part of New York radio now for 37 years. It is 37, right? Well, we just passed the 36th anniversary last week, but I'm into the 37th year. Okay. That's why I'm confused. (laughs) Except for me. (laughs) He's been on uh, New York's WFUV all this time, and he's been a fixture and a great DJ in the New York area. He's done a lot of work on the Beatles, a lot of fine interviews through these many decades on WFUV, and that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hello, Darren. Hello, Ken. Great to be on board. Also with us, we have a man who for many years wrote for the New York Times in their classical department. You probably know him best for a couple of books that he's written on the Beatles. There's From the Cavern to the Rooftop and also Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. He also is a contributing writer to Beatle Fan Magazine. And he's a freelance writer now, writing for a lot of different publications like the Wall Street Journal and occasionally for the New York Times. And that's Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we are welcoming back a special guest who was on this program right around this time about a year ago because he was doing a presentation at the Fest for Beatle Fans. He's a bass player, and um, he did something special on Paul's bass work for the Abbey Road album. He did a fantastic job at the Fest. We had him on our show talking about Paul as a bass player in the Beatles his innovation as a bass player, what made him special, what uh, what he had to learn as a bass player, as we probably will remind everybody in the show this time. He spent uh, seven years being in the Alan Parsons Project. He's also been in the backing band for the Happy Together Tours, and even for uh, a brief while was in the backing band for A Walk Down Abbey Road, which happened back in the early 2000s. And you will occasionally see him gigging, well, occasionally, hopefully every week, in the New York area. And so we welcome back John Montagna. Hello, Hello, John. Hello, hello. hello. Thank you so much for having me again, Ken. It's great to be here. And uh, I must say that after we had you on the show, we got a tremendous response from people uh, just saying how much they loved what they learned about Paul as a bass player. And you had your bass ready, as you do right now. That is, uh, that is correct. Here we to go. Uh, show us yep. some of uh, you know Paul's interesting bass work in the Beatles. It's the only and, way to do it. you gotta, you got to demonstrate it in real time. You can't just talk about it. Mm-hmm. But right now, as we normally do, we'll get to the latest in Beatle news. And John, just like the last time, feel free to add whatever comments you might have. Oh, I'm going to add comments. Okay. You <laughs> can't, can't have a conversation we, about the Beatles without me getting involved. We, we can't <laughs> stop him if we tried. <laughs> First of all, I should say that this is unofficial. Uh, this is according to Roger Friedman's Showbiz 411 column. He says, anyone expecting for any of the Let It Be material for its deluxe treatment for its 50th anniversary to be coming out in May will have to wait for the fall. He says his information reports that no work has been done yet on the mixing, remixing, and so on of the original album, the original movie soundtrack, or the Peter Jackson documentary. The mixing sessions, according to him, are set for July. And another Mm -hmm. reason is uh, that these expensive packages make better sense for a holiday release leading into Christmas time. So I'm not saying this is official. I'm just saying this is what he's reported. Have any of you guys heard otherwise? 
I, I've heard October so, as well. Right. Does that apply to everything, the audio and the video? That's yeah. what I've heard, yeah. But um, I don't know okay. how, how, to, how accurate. To be clear, are, we, are, they, are hmm. they talking about doing a theatrical release as well as a, a home video, like a DVD thing? Well, there's definitely going to be a DVD for the original Let It Be film. Right. And I'm sure that there'll be a DVD and Blu-ray for right. the new Peter Jackson film. Are but they, but as, are they doing a theatrical release as well? They haven't said that, but I'd have to imagine they have to. Mm. Even if it's like a limited thing like the eight days a week film was. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it probably would be like the eight days I a week thing. Let's it's happening on. more and more often these days for these limited runs for everything. Right. right. Even right. Rock Show, Paul McCartney's Rock Show had a limited theatrical release. Right. You know? I mean, there's so much hearsay and news that gets passed around that we don't know what the source is. I have two thoughts immediately. Number one, if, if I may, I don't mean I don't mean to jump in, but um, first of all, the fact that the Let It Be project is being held up and delayed and and staying in the can longer than it's supposed to. That there's a, a certain authenticity to that that I, that I, <laughs> that I kind of appreciate. You know what I mean? Like, like if they really wanted to make, they, they could maybe put it out like a year from now. That's right. Like release it and then pull it off the market. You know, John, do you remember? Do you remember at at the time in Rolling Stone, it became sort of a running joke in the letters column. Every now and then, someone would write in and say, "So when is the Get Back album coming out?" You know, it was because it had been delayed so many times. I don't remember that because it was it was I hate to say this, but it was before I was born. Oh, but really, hmm. <laughs> I was yeah. I'm I'm forty. I'll be forty eight in April. So I, I was born in seventy two. So this was all it was all there by the time I was I was a kid. But I see. let it. I loved the Let It Be album when I was a kid because it was just like you opened up that gatefold cover and it was like a comic book. All those pictures of them like on the roof. It was like it was like they were Spider Man or something. It was great. <laughs> you know, I didn't think in terms of like, wow, that's it's, uh, you know, for them to be jamming on the rooftop and then there's an orchestra on the next track. You know, there's like no continuity here that didn't it didn't really register with me as a kid. That was always one of my favorite records growing up. So to me, if it takes them longer, if they got to push it back a couple of months to make it good, I'm all for it. Let them wait until Christmas. If that means, if, you know, I'd rather that than them rushing through it because they've got a release date set and they put out something half-assed you know what i mean if it takes them until christmas to really do it right because i really i have a lot of expectations for this project because of the the conflicting narratives like uh, there was this narrative coming out that like well turns out they were actually getting along and having a good time during those sessions and we were all scratching our heads like, so wait a minute, for 50 years you've been telling us that they were at each other's throats for a month and George quit and this and that. And now it was, you know, they were having fun and they, they might have stayed together longer. So, like, what is it? I really hope that they dive into the story all the way and they tell the full story, the, the good and the bad. I hope they don't gloss over John and Yoko's heroin use because all of that stuff is what makes the story such an amazing story, that they were at this pivotal moment in their history where they were, you know, on the one hand trying to pull it together and still be the Beatles, but it was, but nature and time were sort of pulling them apart and the power struggle between, you know, Paul trying to keep it together and George coming into his own and just the tension of that. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a fascinating time and it would be a really an amazing document if they were to really tell the story in full I, I think it would really go a long way toward making a lot of people understand them and their artistry on a deeper level. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So let them take let them take longer if they have to. to I'm totally right. with you on this, you know, and certainly where the audio is concerned, because, you know, we've talked about there are what is it, 85 CDs of bootlegs <laughs> yeah. in a, of material there just to whittle it down to the best 25 uh -oh. hours yeah. of stuff, right? <laughs> so that's a lot of work right there. Sure. And to make it sound as good as possible. So just on the audio alone, there's a lot of work to be done there, I would think. So there's also the question of in remixing 
the regular Let It Be album, what they're going to do with things like The Long and Winding Road, because Paul so strenuously objected to Richard Hewson's orchestration. Um, you kind of wonder if, you know, Giles is remixing the thing, but he's never in his remixes before faced a situation where one of the Beatles seriously hated and was kind of vocal about what came out. Um, and he's going to be remixing the album. He has to remix it as something like what the album was. And yet, you know, there's that. So unless they also include Let It Be Naked as a bonus disc or the unadorned long and winding road is one of the bonus tracks. Uh, maybe they can, maybe they can handle it that way. That sounds reasonable to me. I think, you know, let's not forget that that whether Paul hated it or not, I believe that was it, that version of long and winding road was a single. It was. Yep. And it would, and it did pretty well. I mean, you still hear that with the orchestra on, on the radio all the time. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine them doing something, like doing it as the you know with the original album as it was on the original album and then doing a bonus mix with without the orchestra because as much as you know like we all know the recording with the orchestra but we but it's also been well documented how much Paul didn't like it and Glenn Johns I think was has gone on record as complaining about the, the Spectre orchestration yeah. stuff yeah his his but actual funny, words listened. his actual words were it sounds like puke. That's Glenn Johns. Right. <laughs> right. 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 I mean, you know, I, I listened to Let It Be Naked again recently, and I'm pretty sure that the take of Long and Winding Road that's on there is a different take uh -huh. than the one that they added the orchestra to. So if they did the original, I mean, and, and that was, I always had a problem with Let It Be Naked as well, because it sounds like they went to some alternate takes. Right. On some of the things, they did, which I don't, yeah. which I don't know yeah. why. Which I don't yeah. know why if they didn't just take this, you know, the stuff that's on the album, the stuff that made it onto the album was so great, you know. So if they just do the original album and then maybe have a a mix with no um, with no strings, kind of like what they did with the Imagine box that came out mm -hmm. recently. There's like bonus cuts of like just the string section mm -hmm. from Imagine, you know, which I did. It's a that's a nice, it's a nice little treat for people like us and also for casual fans you know and on I mean? the Beatles like, box sets too they do uh, right on the anthology I remember on the anthology they like just had the strings from from Eleanor Rigby which you know you think what you know, what the hell are they doing that for but it does kind of tell the story of like this is now they're moving in this direction in the studio can you you can imagine them like the strings like rehearsing that part before they sang or whatever you know and that that was the sound that was going on yeah but even more recently on the box sets like um for something just the right. guys, beautiful. Oh my chords. god, yeah. I remember the first time yeah. I heard the or just the orchestration killing. Yeah. But the Let It Be Naked uh release also had what they call composites. It's really two two versions edited together of say I've got a feeling was one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. What I they really should bit. do is lot different. <laughs> what they really should do is put out one of the original Glyn Johns mixes of the Get Back album because that was you know straight takes, it was you know not orchestrated <clears throat> and it was what they were originally thinking of releasing. They just couldn't agree upon it. So, right, but, you know, and everyone has it as a bootleg. It, it really should sort of come out legitimately. I was going to say this could be one of the reasons why the reissue is being held up because you know trying to decide how do you put this stuff out that like historically it was such a a mishmash of like what do, you know how is this going to go out because the idea was to kind of go back to the basics mm -hmm. but then they were doing 87 takes of everything and then overdubbing the orchestras on top of it and then the Glenn Johns mix came out then that got pulled and i think they rejected one or two Glenn Johns mixes Right before those even got released, and then the Spectre version came out, you know the the official quote unquote Let It Be album that we all know, and then the Naked, and then all these these bootlegs are are out there. So there's nothing. I don't think there's anything that's in the can that nobody's ever heard mm -hmm. from those sessions, you know. And so the question becomes like, how do you present this stuff? You know, do you just put everything out there? Do you do like? Like, I've got these Miles Davis, you know, the complete Bitches Brew sessions, the complete Jack Johnson sessions. Like, Miles would just record, you know, for hours and hours every day, you know, for a month, 
and then Tio Macero would would whittle it down to an hour. And these box sets are it's like eight discs of like you know a one chord vamp that goes on for two hours, and then you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So do you put out like all thirty seven takes of of whatever, or do you you know how do you choose the best ones? You know. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's what and, I would do. And, and, and as I've said before, no matter what you do, there's going to be people that complain. Sure. You know. Oh. Yeah. What? In the Beatle world, people nah. complain? I mean, ultimately, it's not up to us. I mean, and, and, I'm, and I, I don't know how Paul and Ringo feel about that time period. You know, it's, it seems as I, I get the impression that the, it's, it's not a, a happy memory for them to revisit. The fact that the movies never come out on DVD. You know, it's possible that that's still a sensitive time for them. Who knows? You know, I'm still surprised that the uh, original movie is going to be part of this big reissue campaign mm. because it was the um, the heaviness of the original movie was the main reason why we were told all these years it wasn't coming out it was because it would portrayed the Beatles in a negative light. And they weren't particularly happy about the way it was all portrayed and everything laid out in the original movie. So when we heard Peter Jackson was getting involved, I just figured it's going to be a brand new Let It Be film with a different title. And then it appears that the original movie is going to be here. So what was the hold up all this, you know, all these years? <laughs> Unless that was never an issue uh, inside Apple uh, about the original movie you know, yeah. portraying the band in a negative light. I think Maybe the, it was something else. I think the Peter Jackson thing is what kind of made it possible for them to agree to release the original because the Peter Jackson will show a different perspective of the same, you know, sessions. And that allows them to offset the heaviness of the original Let It Be film. Mm-hmm. They did a lot of work on the original film, you know. I mean, they had restored it. They had um, given it a stereo soundtrack, which it didn't originally have. They had done a lot of interviews with, you know, Neil, and uh, apparently the only footage of Neil not wearing a hat uh, was done for mm-hmm. that. And they they really had quite a package together before the anthology came out in 1995. That's how long they've been <laughs> playing with this thing. Really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Everything came very close to coming out, it seemed as though. Mm-hmm. And then and then they discovered those uh those uh lost Nagra tapes. And then it just everything you just didn't hear about it anymore after that. Well, uh, you know, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that we'll never know. Yeah. And why everything's been delayed. And there's so much hearsay and rumors. And you can always bring them up, but, you know, the, the Beatles themselves. Paul and Ringo doesn't talk about this. Mm-hmm. Nobody will ask him that. You know, if uh, when George was alive, he didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, so much is kept quiet, you know. And, and I, I think we've all heard rumors as to what's delayed Let It Be all these years. But um, let's just be grateful right now that this is being done, you know. Any, any new new take on the let it be film i would like for it to be balanced no doubt about it but the more that you take in audio and video wise the more accurate a picture that hopefully we'll get so i'm just grateful for anything to come out at this point yeah Yeah. i mean there's also hours and hours of conversations that they've had i mean like the day after george left Mm -hmm. they were talking you know there's i mean lennon is on they have him on tape saying, you know, if he doesn't come back by Tuesday, we get Eric Clapton or whatever. Right. Yeah. Or there's, in fact, there was a recently they released this thing where like Paul's talking to the crew. I think John and Yoko weren't in the room and he was talking to like Neil and the crew about John and Yoko saying like, look, you know, it's we're, we're trying to be sensitive. You know, he loves her and he wants her around. But I mean, like, I mean, what the hell, guys, you, you know, like sort of trying to be tactful like how do we like how do we handle the fact that like the dude wants his girlfriend with him in the sessions all the time we're, mm-hmm. we're trying to be, we're trying to be sensitive but we're also trying to like you know run a run a band here you know right and it was probably a very uncertain time for everybody and you know nobody wants to be portrayed negatively i mean there's a video on youtube of john and yoko doing an interview and they are like wasted Oh, yeah. And they have to actually cut in the middle because it looks like John's about to go throw up. Uh-huh. Or he starts like like he starts looking like he's about to throw up, and they have to stop. And then they come back, and when they come back, suddenly he's like 
much more like lucid and 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 you know. So yeah. who wants who wants that out there? You know what I mean? Mm. Right. <laughs> you know who knows? I, it, you know it's it's just such an interesting moment in their history, and it's a month. We're talking about a, just just the month of January. You right. know. So many things happen. You know, we've got to get this thing done by the end of the month because Ringo's shooting a movie. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's the the pressure. And, there's, you know, they're, they're trying to get back in shape as a live band, which was not easy. And just and the 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 personalities clashing. It's a it's a very it's it's such a unique moment. And also the fact that there's so much film. I mean, if there'd been that much film of the pepper sessions or the white album sessions or the revolver sessions you know i think that's why magical mystery tour is so great because it's like some of the only film that we have of them in 1967 you know hmm. so i want to okay. hear john play his bass let's get back to the news <laughs> oh okay well all right <laughs> all right uh, um on. you gotta uh... <laughs> thank you okay <laughs> yeah We'll tease everyone with that, but you got to wait another 10 minutes before he really lets loose on the <laughs> show. <laughs> All right. In more news, as we're recording the show on March the 3rd, we've learned that James Bond producer James Bracoli and Paul McCartney's wife, Nancy Chaval, were hosting an event in support of Democratic presidential hopeful Michael Bloomberg last night at the high-end Conduit Club in the Mayfair District of London. They were expecting a capacity of 200 people for the private drinks event. This was not a fundraiser. It was in cooperation with Bloomberg's campaign team. Michael Bloomberg has previously called Paul McCartney a friend of long standing, and the former mayor was a guest at Paul and Nancy's wedding party in 2011. And thanks to Michael Rossigliano for this news item. Also, thanks to Wayne Cabral for letting me know that Paul McCartney has just appeared on the latest episode of Alan Alda's podcast show. He has one called Clear and Vivid. It's over an hour long. I have not heard it yet, but you can find it at this website. Go to aldacommunicationtraining.com slash podcasts. That should be interesting. Just an interview for an hour. With McCartney, Alan Alda talking to him. Also, on what would have been George Harrison's 77th birthday, the Liverpool City Council and the Harrison Estate proudly announced the launching of the George Harrison Woodland Walk, a memorial woodland opening to the public in the spring next year. Danny Harrison said on his Facebook page that artists are now encouraged to submit artwork for the garden. It'll be located in South Liverpool, close to where George was born and grew up. This is a 12-acre Greenland site opposite Allerton Towers, and it's currently a mixture of mature woodland and meadow. George's website says that the longer-term aim is for a nature classroom to be opened on the site allowing school children from across the region to spend time learning about nature and the environment. Olivia Harrison says George was an avid gardener who found solace and joy in being in the outdoors. I don't think there is any better way to commemorate him in Liverpool than with a garden which can become a place of tranquility and reflection for everyone. I am really looking forward to watching it change and grow over the coming years. End of quote. Uh, the site was acquired by the Liverpool City Council in 2018, and work is expected to begin in the coming months. Okay? That's fantastic. That's something George would have wanted, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, we visited Liverpool two summers ago, and it's actually a very beautiful place. Beautiful, You know, we, we stayed in the city center, but we also did the tour, the National Trust tour of um, Mendips and of... Uh, Fourthland Road, Paul's mm. house. And it's a really pretty suburb, you know. I mean, I can see it, it, it really, I won't go into it, like how it really changed my perception of them. Seeing where they're from and what a beautiful suburb it is, it really gave me a lot of insight into their characters and what, and what drove them to want to succeed. So I think having a, a, a green space like that for George is going to be really pretty. And really, really nice, you know. Yeah, I went to to Liverpool one time, but I didn't do that tour, and I don't think at the time that um, Mendips was 
and was part of the um, National Trust. But just to be in those homes and with anything preserved the way it was, what a treat that must be. It, you know yeah. what? It was it was more about I mean, yeah, the homes are exciting, but just seeing the the streets, you mm. know, we stayed like I said, we stayed in, in what's called the city center, not far from the cavern. And we took the bus out to the location where the National Trust tours leave from. It's like a botanic gardens kind of place. Mm -hmm. And we get to McCartney's house and we're sitting in the living room and I see and the woman's, you know, describing the thing. I was like, does anyone have any questions? I said, I have an odd question. How did they get from here to the cavern all the time? <laughs> Cause first of all, they all lived at home until 1963. Mm -hmm. That was, that was, I didn't realize that. Like, and I said, like, just how did they get there? Like Neil how did they get them. around? They took the bus. Or Neil. Until Neil came along, they, they took the bus. And I took that bus ride from the city center out to the suburbs. And, and, and it was like, like with their gear and everything. And it, and it oh really God. drove yeah. the story home for me. Like it, it showed like what those guys did to succeed, you know, and see. And then the next day we did like a guided tour. We hired a woman who was like a Beatles tour guide to take us around. And we saw a lot of landmarks. I actually got, I pushed my way into um, the room at St. Saint, Saint Peter's Church where John and Paul met. It's not open to the public, but I saw, I saw a door open. Some, they were setting up for a, a meeting in there. It's like, it's still a functional church. Mm. I, saw, I saw a door open. This, was, this guy was pushing chairs on a thing, and I started walking toward the door, and the woman's like, Can, do you mind if he takes a look inside? He's come all, from, all the way from New York. And the guy, this this old man, looks at me and goes, "You know, there's nothing to see in there." He's <laughs> he's like just right another another freaking American Beatles freak who wants to see hey, the, the inside of the room. You you're know. from New York, aren't you? Right, right, right. But you know, but in any case, I think it's I think it's you know anything that they do in, in Liverpool is great because Liverpool has its own vibe to itself. Uh, more news. Ringo Starr has added a new date to his upcoming All-Star Band tour. It'll be in Red Bank, New Jersey on June the 7th at the Count Basie Center for the Arts. And tickets already went on sale for that February 28th. Ringo's tour kicks off May 29th at the Casino Rama in Ontario. Many of his tours start there, the North American tours. Paul McCartney resumes his Freshen Up tour May 23rd in Lille, France. So, less than three months away, Paul and Ringo get back on the road. Yeah. The new April 2020 issue of Guitar World magazine has the Beatles on the front cover. In bold print, it reads Beatles 70 for 1970. And the words John Paul and George's Guitar Revolution is there on the front cover. There is information in this issue on Paul's stolen bass and how to slide like George and more. <laughs> And sad news to report that Simon Postuma passed away uh, last week on Friday. He and Marika Koger of the Fool Collective designed the clothes at the Apple Boutique. They also made the sleeves for many albums and worked on the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band artwork that wasn't used. They painted the Apple Building at 94 Baker Street in London, painted George Harrison's chimney. Yeah. And also John Lennon's Rolls Royce. Okay, so we're sorry to hear of his passing. Very important group of artists in their story. Mm -hmm. You know that they that they that they came in contact with those people. I think they, what whatever you think about what they did, you know, in terms of their work, it was very they, it was very indicative of the direction that they were going in, the group was going in artistically, and they were seeking inspiration. Uh, from from different sources at that time, so they're crucial players in the history. The full war. It's symbolic of everything that Apple represented. It's yes, freedom, you know, to express yourself artistically in every which way. In this case, with clothes mm -hmm. and the way they painted. So uh, yeah, the visual Sad. thing, sure. Yeah. Uh, also, in our previous show, we had mentioned that for Record Store Day, John Lennon's classic hit, Instant Karma, would be coming out in a 2020 Ultimate Remix from the original multi-track tapes. We heard that it'll be coming out as a 7-inch vinyl single, 
That'll be on April the 18th. Ooh, my birthday. Okay. They designed it just for you, John. Oh, they planned right. that. <laughs> <laughs> a minor, very minor news item, but amusing. Prince Harry and John Bon Jovi posed walking on the zebra crossing mm-hmm. along with choir members. And they recorded at Abbey Road Studios, a new recording of Bon Jovi's Unbroken for an international multi-sport event for injured or sick military personnel. This is one of Harry's final engagements before stepping back as a working royal. There was some footage, very, very brief footage of them in the studio, Harry and uh, John at the mic. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I initially saw was, I think it was a tweet. And just as they were about to sing into the same mic, it ended. I, I have actually something to jump in uh, regarding Record Store Day. Okay. Yesterday, uh, I got wind of the fact that we could be looking at a uh, re-release of the McCartney album uh, using the Half Speed Master tapes, or at least maybe a new Half Speed Master uh, edition of McCartney coming out, I'm going to assume, on vinyl uh, for Record Store Day. Because now things are starting to leak out from a variety of bands on things that are coming out on Record Store Day. But the official list hasn't been released yet. But yesterday, uh, I did see something about there being a half-speed master of McCartney uh, out on Record Store Day as well. Okay, no doubt that's for practice. its anniversary. Yep, That's practically the 50th, yeah, the 50th anniversary. Wow. It's a lot of 50th anniversaries this year. Right. You know? As we get into the solo careers of the Beatles, you know, more prominently with their, you know, studio albums. Just a few more things, some uh, books to mention. There's a brand new book that's out called The Paul McCartney Catalog, a complete annotated discography of solo works, 1967 through 2019 by Ted Montgomery. That's just been released. I just did an interview with Ted. I plan on doing more. We only covered the 70s for Paul with Ted. But um, it's a nice book. It's very concise and it covers everything. The studio releases, the live recordings, his classical music, bonus material on the archive box sets. It's very complete and it takes you all the way through uh, the last McCartney single for Home Tonight and In a Hurry. Wow. New uh, book from Ted Montgomery. Also, I didn't realize this till now, there was a book that was released in November about the legendary music producer and engineer Al Schmidt. It's called Al Schmidt uh, on the record, The Magic Behind the Music. It has a foreword from Paul McCartney in it. They work together on Paul's Kisses on the Bottom album. And Al has worked with everybody, really, in the music business. Frank Sinatra, Sam Cooke, Barbara Streisand, Toto, Steely Dan, you name it. He is now 89 years old. And there also will be a book coming out on Derek Taylor. Really? A biography on his. It's called Derek Taylor for Your Radioactive Children. <laughs> <laughs> Days in the Life, Days in the Life of the Beatles Spin Doctor by Andrew Darlington. That's coming out October the first, according oh, to that, Amazon. He's always been one of my favorite characters in the story, Derek Taylor. He's a Can't fascinating like- person. I can't. I can't wait to to read that. I, oh wow, that's so cool. Spin doctor is the perfect term to use. <laughs> mm-hmm. Describe him. So that's it for the news. So in, a a of, in only forty three minutes. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for today's show. <laughs> so that's it for our very brief news pro- <laughs> broadcast here on the show. So why don't we get to our main topic since we have John here as our special guest. And he will be appearing at the Fest for Beatle Fans the last weekend in March, the 27th. Oh, wait, it's it's, uh, 27th, 28th, and 29th. Yeah, so I'm on Saturday the 28th. Right. I don't know which, uh, what my time slot is. Last year it was at 12, but it will be on the Apple Jam stage. That I know. Okay. Now, last year, you did a workshop on the Abbey Road album and Paul's incredible bass work, which you nailed, by the way. And I, I, I don't know if it's still, is it still online, your playing of Paul's as, bass work? As far as I know, I'm pretty okay. sure. I, I, it's, it's interesting. I, I uploaded, I got video of the whole thing, and I did two 
edited pieces, uh, one demonstrating something and one uh, demonstrating come together. And I uploaded both of them to YouTube and Facebook. Didn't get a lot of traction on YouTube, but the something video got something uh, on, on Facebook. It got something like 50,000 views or something like that. And it's, wow. it's been shared a bunch of times. And it's in fact, it's been a minute since I checked. It could be even more than that uh, at this point. But um, let me see here. Yeah, we're at fifty six thousand something views of the Amazing. of the uh, of the something video. Yeah, but yeah, it really it really struck a chord with people. I'm very uh, it's been very gratifying to see that this thing that I've been sort of obsessed with since I was a kid uh, resonates with so many people. I, I'm really surprised by the reaction that so many people coming up to me afterward. You know, telling me like, wow, I never paid attention to the, you know, to the bass playing like that. or I never saw it like that, you know. So, you know, I keep diving in to try to learn more and more. Well, that, I can uh, say it's wonderful to watch. So I would advise everyone who listens to the show to check it out. Thank you. That uh, appearance you made last year at the Fest in Jersey City was one of the highlights of the weekend, in my opinion. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> What's, I mean, what's what's better? It's like, you know, you preach into the choir. You know, you get up on a on a Saturday morning. It was a beautiful, sunny day. You know, they have the Apple Jam stage set up in that, you know, floor-to-ceiling, like, glass windows there. It's first event of the day. I was all, you know, hopped up on caffeine, and I'm just, like, talking about McCartney's bass playing to a room full of, you know, Beatle freaks. It's like, you know, what could be better than that? Mm. You know, I, I want to ask you, first of all, that when you have to learn McCartney's bass part, do you learn it by ear? Or, you know, these days with the luxury of like the rock band mixes and there's all these isolated tracks that have been floating around, you can hear Paul's isolated bass track on certain Beatles songs, which makes it a lot easier. But how do you how do you know exactly how Paul played those notes? You know, because um, there's also a book that came out in Japan many years ago with all the Beatles songs and every single part and how it's played. Right. I mean, did, did you investigate that? How did you learn no, I, to play <clears throat> exactly what Paul played and how he played it? I, I'm going to quote a great quote that David Crosby used in the Brian Wilson documentary that came out many years ago. I just wasn't made for these times. Mm -hmm. him, and, him and Graham Nash talking about, like, you know, Brian Wilson's genius for vocal arranging and for harmonies. And Nash says, how do you how do you learn how to do that? How do you learn that? And Crosby goes, by sitting in your room and making that your deal in life. <laughs> and that was pretty much, you know, 1984, 1985. I picked up the bass for the first time in February of 1984. I was already playing the guitar. I'd been through drums, guitar, keyboards. I started plucking on the bass when I was around the time I turned 12. And I didn't play sports. I didn't have comic books. I wasn't into Star Wars. It was me and my and the bass and those Beatles records. And I learned how to play playing along to Beatles records. Mm. So I would learn, yeah, I would learn the parts, but what I was absorbing was Paul's approach and a certain sensibility that he has and choices that he makes. I said, and I said this during the workshop, you can transcribe, you can get the isolated bass track and transcribe it note for note and, and do all that. And that's fine. I'm less interested in that than I am interested in what's, what, what choices is he making in the moment how is he going to respond to what Ringo's doing, what John's doing, what George is doing? How is he functioning as a member of the rhythm section? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these songs, you know, like I said, I learned how to play, playing along to those records. And I just assumed for years and years and years that I knew all those parts backwards and forwards. It was only later on, it was only years later when I started working with the real serious tribute people that, that, they started pointing out like the actual parts that he played. And I was like, Oh, and I had to go back and kind of learn them. I don't, and to, to this day, I think there's a lot of parts that I don't necessarily know, like note for note, but I feel like 
if, if I can pat myself on the back, my my understanding is it of, of of is is more about how he chose to function as a rhythm section player. Because your job, no matter who it is, whether you're Paul McCartney, Getty Lee, uh, Flea, James Jamerson, Chuck Rainey, your job is to outline the harmony, to provide a foundation for the band harmonically and rhythmically, and to be a catalyst to make the band sound good and everybody does that in a different way so you can play all the right notes get all the right gear you know replicate the the signal chain from the strings to the bass same cables are used same amp all that stuff but no one is going to have paul mccartney's 20 something year old brain reacting in that moment Mm. and that's that's what interests me is the is the choices that he makes you know you take a track like veronica by elvis costello Mm-hmm. You know, with the chord changes to the bridge, it's like a D, D minor descending. Do you sit by the railing and Veronica's gonna have it? And why somebody would go. You know, why would somebody choose to play to go up that high and play that pentatonic riff down like that? That's what interests me, the choices that he that he makes and the sensibility of that. And I wanted to find out where that came from, because like I said in the class and like I said on last year's podcast, there were no bass players for him to copy. You know, if you can, the the, the bass guitar was only a couple of years old uh, when he started playing and there were no YouTube videos for him to to watch. There were no. Mel Bay beginning guitar ba- uh, you know, beginning bass guitar books for him to read. He had and and he was on the job immediately. He got the bass and more. It's very likely was like the day he got his bass. He was on a gig with it that night. Mm-hmm. All the rest of us we practice and we practice and we practice and eventually after a couple of years we're good enough to play a gig. Right? He was probably playing bass on stage the day he got his instrument and learned on the job. Which is extraordinary. Yeah, that's what me, yeah, exactly. That's, that's why I maintain that he's the architect of <laughs> the vocabulary on the, on the bass guitar. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, you could even hear from those very earliest Beatles songs that he, uh, he was, he, he was a, a head of not just the, his bandmates, but almost everyone in popular music. Mm-hmm. You know what he was doing, even from the very beginning. You know, and, and because it's the bass, I guess folks don't pick up on it right away. No. Uh, you know, when you listen to something, I mean, I always think of the best example. I saw her standing there, the bass part on. I saw her standing there, but I'm sure there's a couple of others that I'm not thinking of now where it's so clear. This is 1963, and he's already playing like that. Right. Well, you're also you're also dealing with a different kind of talent. You know, not just Paul, but all of them. I mean, the thing that made the Beatles what they were and are and why they have the Fest for Beatles fans every year, why you've got this podcast, Ken, why this this group that from origin story to breakup was in existence for 13 years, why we're still talking about them to this day. There was just an attitude and a, a sense of adventure that those guys had. I mean, again, visiting Liverpool and seeing where they're from and meeting other people from Liverpool and seeing that the character that that city has, it made a lot more sense too. But there was just this, this pioneering spirit of adventure. Like, well, okay, well, here's this thing that does this. What else can we do with this? Why can't we try this instead? You know, they just were not afraid to break the rules when it came to anything well what you know oh that that's a leslie speaker it's for the hammond organ that's nice why can't we put a mic through it why can't i sing through that why can't we put the guitar through it you know well, can't we have the backwards tape you know why can't we run the tape backwards and you know put that on the record you, you know what i mean and so when it came to bass playing trying to analyze paul's bass playing from the with the standards that you analyze anything else musically, you know, you're, you're not talking about somebody who went to school and studied, you know, they had a job, 
they, they were they were working you know whatever it was five hours a night seven hours a night seven nights a week you know in these clubs in germany where they just had to make you know drunk sailors and prostitutes dance like that was your training like get up there and make make it happen you know with whatever you had so you know so by the time they get it they get into the studio they they they're they're just they willing to try anything and so they they you know a little bit from i mean he sort of standing there and he's he's admitted to ripping that off of a chuck berry line but i mean most bass lines are built on root five root three five you know i mean it's, there's a the the vocabulary of blues and rock and roll you know they were they were steeped in that but they were also steeped and, and, I, and I made this point in the class too he's applying He's using all of his musical skills and all of his tools, all of his abilities, and applying it not just on, on the rock and roll tunes of the day, but also they did, you know, the show tunes and the standards, you know, Till There Was You, the Honeymoon Song, you know, just the, the full spectrum of American popular music that he's applying to this thing. And they're, they're absorbing all of this stuff and just laser focused on it to the exclusion of everything else you know what i mean yeah mm -hmm. um what i find a little puzzling sometimes is reading his interviews and listening or, or reading to him talk about the bass um and his relationship to the bass and you know here you have a guy who as you say totally revolutionized bass playing i mean you listen to rain or paperback writer or you know so many things and yet he talks about having been lumbered with it. That's a phrase he's used a few times. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's just kind of, it, it's like, uh, you know, if you talk to Muhammad Ali about boxing and he says, yeah, you know, you, you hit some guy, <laughs> you know, I just don't know how to, how to sort of, um, you know, bring these two things together that he was so spectacular at it. And yet, it, it seems like not what he mainly wanted to do. I think he wanted to be lead guitarist, really. Who knows? You know, who knows? I mean, what he, what he says to an interviewer once in, you know, in, in 50 some odd years of giving interviews might not be his definitive feeling about it. I think it made sense, given what we know about them, that at that time, you know, Paul was already messing around on the piano. Mm-hmm. He was filling in on drums a couple of times. So it made sense that, you know, I mean, what I'm curious about is once Stu Sutcliffe quit the band, you know, why they decided to dispense with the three guitar lineup instead of getting a bass player. They made John George and Paul made the decision. Well, then, like one of us should just take up the bass. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious how that transition was made. Because, Although, because Klaus really wanted to do it. Is that right? Yeah, Klaus talked to them about, about joining, and they, they talked him out of it. It's in uh, Mark Lewison's book, Tune In. Okay, yeah, because I found this out, I remember years ago going on the website for uh, the Fab Faux, at the excellent New York uh, tribute, uh, I, I don't want to call them a tribute band, with, with Will Lee, Richard, yeah, I don't know, all those guys. And... Um, they had a thing on their website, Frank's Trivia Corner. Frank Agnello, who's uh, one of the guitarists in the band, he's apparently like the Trekkie Beatle expert in that band. <laughs> so I went on, oh, Frank's Trivia Corner. Oh, this will be funny. I figure like no one's a bigger Trekkie than me. I'm going to ace this stuff. So I go on, first question, knocked me on my ass. I, I look at it and he goes, three people, but when, after Stu Sutcliffe quit the band, Three people played bass for the Beatles before Paul McCartney. Who were they? I was like, what? Jazz and, and apparently, I, <laughs> Jazz Newby was one of them. There was, there was a period where I guess they had some other, Paul stayed on the guitar and had some other, and there was some other guys filling in on bass. I mean, again, unless you have like the day by day account of what went down in the band, you know, any number of things is possible. But all I know is like at some point, it, the the decision was made like, okay, Paul, you're the bass player. Hmm. Like everything else that Paul plays, he brings a certain musicality to it. I mean, listen to Paul play guitar. Listen to listen to Paul's guitar solos. Listen to his drumming. You know, he's just the, the, it, you, you're dealing with a very special kind of talent. Hmm. 
you know? And it just so happens that, yeah, he brought all this, you know, melodic inventiveness and all this creativity, but he also understood the job, you know, holding down the rhythm section, which rolls out the red carpet for the Let It Be sessions that I wanted to get to. You know, he never strayed from the basic function of the bass. This is the genius of his parts, is that as as, as decorative as they get and as inventive and as he, you know, plays every note except the root of the chord and all this inventive stuff, he's always maintaining the groove and providing this foundation for the band. You know, he, he, he never doesn't do his job. You know, the bottom never falls out. You know, he's able to create, you know, tension and release. And there's just, there's a genius there that he just, cause it just, it's pure instinct, you know? Mm. So, yeah, I know I, I wanted to get into the let it be, get back, whatever you want to call them, January 69 sessions that we were talking about before, because it was, the, the sessions were called get back originally, right? Cause they wanted, they wanted to get back. You know, I, I, I don't know it's at, at what point the song came up, but I mean, that was that song was sort of like the key song. I mean, it's pretty well documented that they worked on it a long time mm-hmm. for a two chord. I mean, for a, for a tune that's like, that's basically got two chords in it. They really did a lot of takes of it. Right. I mean, it was the single, it was the title of the album and it was kind of like the mission statement for that project of getting, of getting back, like returning to the roots of getting the, the band to play live again. So that meant, for Paul on bass, interacting with the live rhythm section again and the immediacy of that. And that requires a completely different approach and a different skill set than, you know, sitting up in the control room and composing a bass line after the fact, like after everything else has been put on, you're putting on the bass last, which we know that he did a lot, like on, on Pepper. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of those rhythm tracks, you know, you hear those tracks on the anthology and on the box sets, there's no bass because bass would go on last and he would come up with a cool counter line. Okay, now he's down there in the trenches with Ringo laying it down, you know, and we know that the get back sessions were sort of instigated by Paul. We know that it was, you know, it's been pretty well documented that he wanted to get on stage again. He missed playing live with the band. And I think the evidence of the fact that he's still doing it now, 50 some odd years later, you just cannot get that guy off the stage, you know? So he jumped into the role of rhythm section guy again. And so how did his bass playing change compared to like the, the quote unquote studio era of the decorative stuff? Now he's getting more, much more solid, much more functional. I hesitate to use the term simpler, but you know, we're not talking about like the pet sounds uh, inspired, you know, contrapuntal, you know, melody goes up, bass line goes down or whatever. He's down there to lock in with the drums and hold down the groove. You know, it's like they're in the cavern again or they're in Hamburg with what's his name saying, uh, Max Shaw. You know, it's like we're on stage. We got to make this thing happen. But there are times where his melodicism will, will, will jump out. You know, listening back to these bass lines again, I was listening to one after 909. This is traveling on the one after 909. By the way, forgive my voice because I'm kind of sick, but in any case. And he's, so he's on stage, he's up there singing live with this thing. Move over, honey, traveling on that line. I mean, this is like they're, they're a bar band again. You know, just move over one, move over twice. Come on, baby, little be cold as ice. You know, he's, he, he'll just lay it down, root five. But he does this great line in there in the bridge. Got the bag. To the station. Real man said. He got the wrong location. That, that, you know, moving the, because normally you'd have the root and the fifth. You'd have the root on the downbeat and then the fifth afterward. And he switches it up. You know, every he's still thinking like a songwriter all of it you know even even when he's just laying down a pocket he can't help but make it all flow together like a melody you know it just it, it, he never it never sounds like he's now i'm playing this chord and now i'm playing this chord 
and now I'm playing this chord. It always flows, you know, as one line. Um, and then it gets to the solo. You know, like he's he's playing the half notes. And then the, 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 the guitar solo. He starts digging in like steady quarter notes. You know, and it's like he's back in Hamburg or back in the cavern, like jamming away, you know. He's digging in really hard, and he's playing the Hofner again, which is much lighter. He's, you know, he's standing up at the mic, you know, and he's and he's driving the band, which is, you know, not that he wasn't doing that before, but I realized watching, you know, listening to those tracks again and watching the rooftop footage again, all of those songs, the the more rocky songs from that. Uh, those sessions, 909, I've got a feeling, Get Back in particular, um, he's, it, you know, it's, it's a, you know, there's, there's an aggressiveness there that I believe we are beginning to see the start of the Wings model, you know, it's no, it's no longer, you know, what would you do with that thing? You know, it's, he's not, you know, he's not dancing around. This is not, uh, you know, this is now. Yeah, be where my love. Found the ball, you open. You know, got a movie in his hand. You know, you know. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Down to Junior's farm where I want to lay low. You know, or it, oh, oh, sweet darling. You know, he's back. He's he's singing the blues, mm. you know, right. He's rocking out. And I can tell you from experience, being a singing bass player gives you a lot of control over the band. You know, if you look at guys like Sting, Jack Bruce, when, when, when you're when you're the bass player and the front man, you're the top and the bottom at the same time. You know, I sailed away one night in June. You know, as long as everybody knows the chords and the drummer's solid, I mean, you're controlling a lot of stuff. And I think Get Back in particular is the beginning of like, if you, if you look at the direction that Wings went in, if you look at the, like the early Wings stuff, the university tour, and later on, even when they were like a giant, you know, stadium juggernaut with Wings Over America, he was, you know, this was not, you know, sort of pretty experiments. This was, this was like, you know, people gather here tonight. I want to listen to me. And, and, you know, this is, you know, rock and roll. And I think he's a really underrated bass player in that regard. People think of McCartney's bass playing. They think about the contrapuntal lines and the melodic stuff and all the experimental stuff. But he also knew how to drive a band. And the Let It Be sessions gave him that opportunity. Would you say, John, that his bass playing was intentionally simpler because he was thinking that these were songs that he was going to do live and he would concentrate um, more on the studio recordings, the ones that were strictly studio and really elaborate on the bass more on those? What you want to you mean on the on the Let It Be sessions? Well, like, for example, some of the really intricate stuff that he has done, say, on Abbey Road. OK. Very more involved. The bass is going all over the place, as opposed to what you were just doing right now, or yeah. like uh, Junior's Farm. That those kind of songs are simpler bass lines. It's much easier for him if the bass lines are simpler when he knows that he's going to do it live. It's possible. I don't think it was a conscious decision. Like, oh, I'm going to write a simple bass line because I'm playing it live. I think he's he's a guy that follows his muse. He lets the song tell him what to do. He's not. He does not reverse engineer the songs. I, I don't think. I don't know. I mean, he honestly, the only person who could answer that question is is him. And, you know, if and when I get to sit him down for an hour and, and talk to him <laughs> about it, this stuff, I'll ask him, were you specifically writing like, oh, I better write some rock and tunes because we're doing a tour? You know, although I could say that, you know, I think it's pretty well documented that they wrote I'm um, Down because they needed a new song to close the show mm -hmm. and they didn't want to close with long tall Sally anymore. So it's, it's very possible. On the other hand, I could also say that, you know, what's simple, 
what's you know i mean you could you could say yeah you could say that that's simpler but to make that happen to 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 just play eighth notes and lock into the drums and the guitars and 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 make a rhythm section to to glue a rhythm section together there's an art and a science to that that he's great at yeah so maybe he's not playing as many notes maybe he's not playing as much as much complicated stuff because he's also the front man too he's also singing you know i mean i subbed a couple of times with strawberry fields uh this great beatles tribute band here in new york and i had to play penny lane live with the pepper coat on with the wig with the mustache painted on in penny lane there is a barber showing photographs of every head he's had the pleasure to know i mean talk about like rubbing your tummy and patting your head at the same time <laughs> you know he wasn't thinking in those terms i think he was again wings don't forget, he was also trying to get away from the Beatles model. He just wanted to get on stage and rock out with the band. I mean, they went and did that university tour. They didn't have a set list, practically. They just got up and jammed on rock and roll. That's what he wanted to do. So I don't think it was an, I don't think it was an issue of like, oh, I'm just going to write simpler songs because I'm on stage. I think the band was together. He was, he was, he was following his muse. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, but, uh, you know, it was it was a different band. It was a different time. He also had more responsibilities running wings. And he's and he's talked about that as well. Right. Um, you know, he didn't have Apple. He didn't have Brian Epstein. He's now the band leader. He's the business manager. He's the front man. You know, he's running the whole thing himself. He's got a lot of other things to worry about. So when he gets on stage, he's going to he's going to jam. And also, you know, in the seven by the 70s, by that time. T-Rex was happening, Bowie was happening, you know, the, the, the scene was different. And I know he always kept an eye on what was happening around him musically and, and tried to react to that. So, you know, it's a chicken or egg kind of thing. Hmm. Darren, Alan, uh, want to ask John a few questions? Yeah. Um, you know, he has also talked about when uh, someone, I can't remember exactly where it was, asked him. Um, why his playing on his solo stuff um, seems to be simpler than it was with the Beatles. And he's basically said, well, you know, the, the styles have changed, which is, you know, in, in a way in, in the Beatles time, he made the style. Um, but what do you think are his best bass lines um, in Wings or even after Wings, like as a solo career uh, artist, um, what is what what strikes you as the the bass lines that you think are the most challenging or most beautiful or that you just like the best? Huh. You know, again, we're talking about a different Wings was a much different band than the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And his role was different. This is no longer, as, as John Lennon said, you know, call it Wings all you want, but they're still backup men for Paul. Right. Right. So it's not like he was an equal in that band, no matter how much they tried to, you know, you know, you give you can give Denny Lane all the lead vocals on the album you want. You can you can, you can let Jim, you can let Jimmy McCullough do Medicine Jar all you want. People are coming to see Wings to see one guy. So it was a different kind of a band, and and his role in that band, musically and otherwise, was completely different from what it was in the Beatles. You know, I remember when I first started learning how to play, trying to figure out "She's My Baby." from Wings of, Wings of the Speed of Sound, trying to figure out. You know, I was so proud of myself when I... You know, I was so proud of myself when I figured that line out. But again, learning the notes is one thing, but learning how to phrase it... Ah. Knowing when to cut it off, knowing how long to let him ring. You know, slide. You know, all the slides and all the, the phrasing stuff. One line that I always loved was um, on Red Rose Speedway. There's a couple of lines on Red Rose Speedway that I like, but Loop First Indian on the Moon when it comes back in after the yes. little mm -hmm. Space Jam. Mm. <laughs> and he lays off the downbeat. One. And he 
goes like this. I mean, to play, first of all, not to not play the downbeat. So it's three, four, one. Right. 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 So it's the, the chords are like it's E ma- E minor and then it's an E major. Right. I mean, the first time I heard to, to end on like the, basically the major seven of the of, of the A was just so sassy. And then it comes around again the next time once the, once the band is in. I mean, because normally you would just go the pentatonic riff, but he goes. That's just ah, so sassy, so cool. You know, another solo line that I love is "Take It Away," which I don't know why we don't. I don't know why that song isn't on the radio every day. <laughs> but you know, again, totally. Off the downbeat, three, four, one. Just perfectly functional, outlines the harmony, pushes the rhythm, but is beautiful on its own. And he gets um, these licks in on, in the verses. Lonely child, out on the road. With a heart. waits there's a space there in the vocals you know i talked about this with the something line he always puts the fancy stuff in where there's nothing else happening where there's room for it you know the great uh new york session bassist gordon edwards once told me about about playing the bass he says we're like linemen in the football (laughs) game he says we're looking for holes we're looking for spaces to fill you know you, you don't you 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 look you look through the line and you and you see an opening to go through, and that's and that's what uh, that's what Paul does every time. With a hundred miles, ah, fuck. With a hundred miles to go, yeah. So I mean, it just creates just enough tension that you're waiting for the next thing to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of some other. Good times coming is another one from. Uh, Press to play. From press to play. Good times coming. Good times coming. Good times coming. Happy at the good times coming. You know. I can I think of two that I'm, I'm curious. That. I can think of two that I'm curious what your your take on, is on. Um, one is a, a song I actually don't like that much, but I find the bass line basically its redeeming <laughs> value, which is Silly Love Songs. Yeah. They're the right. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I mean, having played this on stage before many times with our, with our mutual friend Ed Ryan, yeah. um, again, we're talking about like being on stage and having the responsibility of, of, of driving the band when you've got like big rhythm section and the horns and all these people and you're the guy this is an awesome responsibility I mean, you're carrying the water for everybody mm-hmm. you know what else could you play there you know I mean I mean, I don't know how we came up with this, but, you know, it's, there was a documentary. No, it wasn't a documentary. There was a a show in England, the South Bank show. And it was one of these like Bravo profiles type shows in England. And they, they did an episode on McCartney and they had this, um, some musicologist, I forget his name, some English, you know, one of these, you know, intellectual guys talking about what a genius McCartney was. And he's, he nailed it. He said, McCartney's genius is that he makes the unexpected seem inevitable. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> you know, he'll do things that are so out of left field, so unusual, but you hear it and you go, well, of, of course, that has to be where it is. What else would you play there? What else could you possibly play there? You know what I mean? Now, I don't know if that's because we're conditioned some from, from hearing silly love songs our whole life to that for, for that to be the baseline. But it, it's just the perfect line. It fits in with everything else. It, it, it glues everything together. And it's cool on its own. Mm-hmm. You know, that's his genius. You, you, you isolate one of his bass lines and it stands alone as its own thing. That's true. You know? The other one was so bad. I have the. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's a nice line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the verses. I mean, it's, you know, root five root. I mean, that's, you know, it would have been perfectly acceptable for him to go. You know, any session player would have would have probably just done that, like mimic the bass drum. Right. Mm-hmm. But he's. Going, I mean, you mean so much to me. He's in the high register, and then he goes down. Girl, I love you. I mean, it's it's augmenting the lyrics too. Girl, I love you so bad. And the space. You know, it's like a counter melody there. Yeah. You know, one of the thrills of my life. I always joke about like everyone, you know, who went to see a hard day's night in the theaters. You know, all the all the musicians who were playing guitar for a little while and then they saw Hard Day's Night. They went to the movie theaters to see a Hard Day's Night and they were inspired to buy a Rickenbacker 12 string the next day. <laughs> OK, I had that experience with Give My Regards to Broad Street, <laughs> seeing really? that movie in the theaters and see, seeing him. Oh, dude, the band rehearsal scene where he's in the warehouse with Ringo and Dave Edmonds and Chris Bedding and he's playing the Rick. Mm-hmm. To be 12 years old and obsessed with the Beatles since the time you're three, and there's a movie with Paul playing the Rick. Are you kidding? <laughs> I was. I just sat there with my mouth open, going like, "That's that's who I want to be. Not that's what I want to do. That's who I want to be." You know. <laughs> and if you've seen that, if you've seen that movie, I mean, it's like his feet don't touch the ground. He's like Superman. He's got the the flashy car. Every time he walks into a room, there's like a band like waiting for him. He's everything is, you know, he's like, he's the, he's like the capo de tutti capo. I mean, he's like, <laughs> every, you know what I mean? He's like, the, he's like the master of the universe. But then he gets up and he's like, and the band rehearsal scene with not such a bad boy and all that, it's, mm-hmm. it's killing, you know, and just the sound of that. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to go back and hear the mix of that movie, but I seem to remember the sound of the Rickenbacker bass in the movie theater thinking like that's the coolest gig in the world to be the singer and the bass player and play those bass lines like that you know so inspired i have a, a question regarding the relationship between the the bass player and the drummer which we all know is uh, critical okay. to a good band yeah. and early on paul played with pete best uh but the what we know and uh well is of course ringo right. and for roughly approximately eight years, Ringo was playing behind and Paul, uh, and they were both growing up together. They were still young, regardless of the fact that they were already accomplished, uh, brilliant musicians. They were still, you know, still finding their way in their 20s. And suddenly the Beatles break up. Uh, Paul right. wants to start his own band. And he unfortunately is unable to settle in on one I'm sure he would love to have had one drummer, maybe it be Denny Sywell, to to stay the whole the whole way and link up with him. How do you think McCartney's bass playing was affected or his technique or his approach or anything was affected by the fact that from 1971 until 1980, Wings went through Denny Sywell, Jeff, Jeff Britton, Joe, Joe English and Steve Holly. Steve Holly. Uh, I mean. 
How does uh, McCartney, the bass player, over a period of uh, roughly eight, nine years, yeah. uh, constantly having to adjust to a new bass player, four different ones, how You'd do you think that to, affected him? Okay, you would have to ask him that, to be honest. I mean, I could go back and listen to all those Wings recordings and, and see if there's any difference, you know, in the way he phrases things from one drummer to the next. Mm -hmm. So I can only speculate. I can only make an educated guess that it was, you know, he's again, he's everything that that guy does is seems to be purely instinctual. On the other hand, I could argue that there's, you know, there's, there's, I'm sure there's rehearsal tapes that exist of them like doing endless amount of takes of one song or another. But I think the giveaway is that every time that when they, that when they, the, 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 the first order of business was always to hold drum auditions. Like when they, right. first, like when Paul and Linda went to New York to do the Ram album, the first thing that they did was audition drummers. Right. You know, they didn't look for a guitar player, or a keyboard player. The first thing was to look for a drummer after band on the run. When, you know, when Sywell and, uh, and Henry McCullough quit and then they did Band on the Run with just Paul and Danny and Linda. Now it's time to put the band together. First thing they did was hold drum auditions. Yeah. Interesting. It's also interesting in that period that you just mentioned, Danny Sywell and Jeff Britton to me were very different drummers. Yeah. You know, where Danny Sywell was more of a, a, a jazz guy, played with a very unique technique. Yeah. Actually occasionally reminded me of Ringo on, at times. Jeff Britton, powerhouse, and you can tell yes. from the few, from the little bit of footage sure. that there is. Yeah. And same with Joe English to an extent. Mm -hmm. They were powerhouse rock drummers. Correct. But the sidewall to Britton thing is like had to be a little jarring, but maybe not. Probably. Again, I think from what I what little I know about what was going on then, and I only again I only know the stories that have been told, the, the books that have come out. I think he was looking for a personality. He's looking for guys that he can get along with. And that's, you know, never mind musically, just who's going to be able to be in the room with that guy and hang. I don't care who you are as a drummer. Like you're playing in a band with one of the Beatles. So you know, this is something I've wanted to talk to Denny Sywell about. Actually, he usually turns up at the at the at the fests, and I and I, I've met him a few times, and he's a sweetheart of a, of a guy, and he's a monster drummer too. And I've also done a bunch of gigs with Steve Hollykin, as as you know. Yep. And you know, I've wanted to talk to them a while about like how long did it take you to forget about the fact that like it's it's Paul, it's Beetle Paul. And, you know, how long did it take you to sort of like forget about that and just get down to the business of locking in as a rhythm section? I mean, I went to see Greg Bissonette, the great drummer. Greg Bissonette mm -hmm. did a clinic and he's been touring in Ringo's band for the last couple of years. Do, you know, dual drums with Ringo. And I asked him, I said, you know, being in a rhythm section, being in a double, you know, playing double drums with anybody had presents its own set of challenges. How do you go about playing double drums with Ringo what are the specific considerations that you need to take as a drummer and how long did it take you to get over the fact that it's like holy crap it's Ringo over there and he goes well first of all why are you assuming that I've gotten over it <laughs> <laughs> like he says I still it's been five years or ten years or whatever to this day I'm still I look over and I go oh my god you know but just be, yeah, paying attention to how he phrases things my other educated guess is that, hey, man, it's Paul's band. You listen to him. The drummer adjusts to him, you know, or on the other hand, I could be completely off the mark about that. I don't know. My, my, my guess is that, like, when they were auditioning drummers, they're looking for guys that they can hang with, you know, guys who are going to get along and be able to, you know, that they can gel personality wise, because then that's going to come out in the music, too. I don't think that he's I don't think that Paul's consciously going, yeah, I'm looking for a guy that's got like a jazz sensibility, or I'm looking for more of like an R&B flavored guy. You know, I, I don't know that he was consciously seeking a, a specific type of, 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 of drummer. Again, that's a, that's, a, that's a question for him. You know, I mean, but you listen to those records, and there are definitely there's, there's a quality to the sound of the band on Red Rose Speedway that Venus and Mars doesn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a yep. certain polish 
to the Venus and Mar- to Venus and Mars and and uh, and speed of sound that you know Red Rose Speedway has more of a is, is a little bit looser, you know, because Sywell's a jazz player, you know, he's he's mm-hmm. coming he's he's come from he's come from a from a, from a jazz background and and doing and doing sessions, you know, so how did he adjust? That's that that's a question for him, but. Given what we already know, I don't think you're going to get a technical answer from Paul. I don't think he's going to say, "Oh yeah, once I got in there with with uh, with Joe English, you know, I had the way he phrases he phrases things behind the beat or something, and I had to do that." I suspected it was like everything else is purely instinctual. Mm-hmm. He know? probably made Paul probably made the little subtle changes or adjustments. Yeah, uh, you make them as you go along. Hearing. And you do, and again, you think of the way records were made in those days. We weren't playing to a click. Mm-hmm. You do fi- you do fifty takes, and the one where everybody in the control room goes, "That's the one," <laughs> then that's it. You know what I mean? It's a, it was a, it was a different time. They were you know in the seventies, they're competing with like Fleetwood Mac and Peter Frampton, and 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 a whole other a whole other sensibility there. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's there yeah. are so there are so many factors at play besides you know oh this guy's you know phrasing on top of the beat, so I have to adjust that way. You know, it's more of a feel thing. Who's going to walk in the door and not and not be, you know, staring at me the whole time because I'm Paul McCartney? Like, who's going to get down to the business of laying in, you know, playing the drums and d- and getting the job done? Mm-hmm. You know? Right. It's really interesting that you brought that up, Darren, because you've got other drummers that have worked with Paul from, sure. uh, you know, Chris Witten and Blair Cunningham, Abe Laborio right. Jr. They all yeah. have their individual styles, just like. The drummers you mentioned in Wings, and you can say that with the guitarists that have been in Paul's bands. You know, you listen if you study it enough, you can tell the difference between Henry McCullough and Jimmy McCulloch and Lawrence Juber. You know, there's a big difference in their styles, and Paul somehow had to adjust, or the band had to, you know, feel their way through it to get the sound that they did. Right, right, and I think this is a guy again who just loves to play music. I mean, he's going to keep playing music until he can't. Mm-hmm. And Abe Jr., by the way, went to Berkeley the same time I was there. And I sort of kind of knew him peripherally. You know, I, I went to him and he, and he was all nice to me. Hey, man, how's it going? You know, we we we, didn't, we never really got a chance to play together, but I saw him play a lot at Berkeley. And I can and I can tell you that even back then, that guy was a monster musician. Mm-hmm. A monster musician. Every situation I heard that guy in, man, he it was. I loved watching that guy play. I mean, it was just. It didn't surprise me when, like, I mean, it surprised me when I found out, like, oh, wow, he's in McCartney's band. Oh my god, you know. But I've seen that band live a bunch of times, and just he's got that perfect, like, what Quincy Jones calls three hundred and sixty degree musicianship. That guy can play anything. He can play the funkiest funk, the jazz. He swings his ass off. And he can lay into a rock thing like nobody's business. And, you know, he's someone I would love to talk to. Like, like what, how, what, you know, being in a rhythm section with Paul, like, what is, what do you have to do? What do you have to, th- you know, how does he phrase things? Who, like, who's in charge? Like, every bass player and drummer uh, relationship, there's usually, like, you, know, you, you take turns kind of, like, leading the dance, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, like... Is it automatic because he's Paul that you follow him, or is he, you know, like cause I know, cause I know Bissonette was talking about that with Ringo. There were a couple of times where Ringo was like, "No, tell me what to play. What am I supposed to do here? What do you want me to do?" Even though it's he's Ringo and it's his gig, he's letting them lead, you know. And you know, I think I think there was we've heard stories of McCartney's controlling nature in Wings, but I I think he also, you know, the evidence, you know bears out that he created an environment where guys were allowed to shine you know every member of wings had like their their moment to kind of really shine and do their thing you know like henry mccullough's solo on my love i mean if that's all that guy ever did his place would be you know secure in the history you know yeah but having interviewed many of the members of wings they've all kind of said the same thing it's not like they were session musicians for paul if right. they had ideas they wanted to bring to the song mm-hmm. and Paul heard it and liked it, he'd use it. Sure. So a lot of people had input in that group. And yeah. 
It's kind of fascinating, everything you're talking about, because when you mentioned this whole idea about Denny Sywell having a jazz background, it reminded me very much of when Hal Blaine died. Mm. And here is like, you know, arguably the most successful, greatest drummer. And it was played on every conceivable pop record and type of hit song. And yeah. he had a jazz background. And well, yeah. how do you switch off from that to suddenly Just, do every kind of pop record? And there's no doubt about it, because he had that background, the way that he plays is a little bit different than someone who's strictly a rock drummer. I'll tell you why. Because there was no jazz was that jazz was the music that existed. There were there were no rock drummers to copy. You know, it's not like now if if you're if you were a jazz drummer now, if you were going to the University of Miami and you were a full on jazz drummer and someone came to you and said, you know, Pink needs a drummer. You want to do this rock gig. You would probably go and like study some rock drummers and pick up some, you know, some things so that you could go and audition. In the 60s, if you were a drummer of a certain age, you came up playing jazz. You know, I did a podcast a couple of two years ago for Culture Sonar uh, about Steve Gadd. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed a number of number of people that that either knew him or were, you know, in, influenced by him directly. And one of the people I interviewed was Justin DeChocho, who was my jazz band director at Music and Art High School. Phenomenal educator. He was he was um he was the, the dean at Manhattan School of Music for a little while, and he knew Gad growing up. In uh, he was he was from Gad was from Rochester, and um, and DeChocho was from uh, either Buffalo or Syracuse, and so he was talking about growing up in the '60s. And if you were a musician, if you were a serious musician, you played jazz. If you were a real serious musician, you didn't listen. You didn't even listen to rock and roll. You didn't bother with that shit, as he said. <laughs> you, know, you didn't. You didn't play. You know all the, the Elvis and all that. Nuts. That's, that's for that's for cats who can't play. But he did say the Beatles changed everything when those guys came along. You know the the pop music scene going in the rock direction and becoming more sophisticated, where rock music was becoming more sophisticated and the audience was was growing. The jazz musicians suddenly started to embrace those sounds and those rhythms and that and that sensibility. So to answer your question about Hal Blaine suddenly playing rock and roll, Hal was just on a session. He wasn't thinking in terms of, he wasn't listening to rock drummers. He was doing what was required in the moment. Right. You know, you count off the tune and it's, and it's, it's straight eighths instead of swung eighths, you know, and they say, you know, like they're doing the Hawaii five Oh theme and you know, Hal do a fill here. Okay. And he's got 27 toms and he, he does what's necessary in the moment. So I don't think it was a conscious decision to change styles. I think those guys, they're what, what the, the genius of the wrecking crew and so many of the musicians of that era was that there was no template for them to follow. They were making it up as they went along in, in the moment, you know, the funk brothers, the guys who played on the Motown sessions, James Jamerson and Benny Benjamin and uh, Uriel Jones and Earl Van Dyke. Those were jazz musicians. They were jazz musicians in Detroit who got this, sweet session gig where they would play you know r and during the day and because they were jazz musicians because they were trained in the art of improvisation composing on the spot they could take a set of chord changes and nothing else and turn it into a record they could come up you know you know jameson came up with on the spot mm-hmm. you know what i mean so I don't think it was a conscious attempt to like, oh, now we're playing rock and roll versus now we're playing jazz. You do you do what's what's required of you in the in the moment. And if there's nothing to fall back on, nothing to copy, and you you, you make it up as you go along, and you know who knows what you can create when that happens. And I think that's that's what Paul did on on the bass. Like I say, he's the architect of the vocabulary because there was nothing, there was no, there were no guys for him to copy. He was just going with, you know, what, you know, R&B records and all those old rock and roll that he heard and reacting in the moment, you know, Mm -hmm. creating something completely new. What are your feelings, John, about the different bases that that Paul played through the years from the Hoffner to the Rickenbacker? He played the Yamaha. I mean, they all had different sounds. Did they all make sense for the records that he played on? 
Yeah. Is there a reasoning why he'd go back to the Hoffner as he's done in recent Um years? I mean he's he's talked about that. The Hoffner is is light. Right. Um I don't have an actual Hoffner. I have a Carlo Rebelli violin based copy, but it's a pretty authentic rendering of that kind of instrument. It's light and you you hit it like this and like it's still sustaining. Hmm. You know, that's gonna affect the way you play. And when you're on stage and you're singing, you don't want like something like a Rick, which weighs a ton. Wing you down, although we play that all through the Wings era. Again, pure instinct. You know, you pick up an instrument, it's gonna it's gonna cause you to play a certain way. And there's any number of factors that are gonna go into that. The instrument you're playing, who else is in the band, what kind of song it is, how big the room is, what you ate that day, you know, whichever instrument it is. I mean, again, you know, they asked him why why did you choose the Rickenbackers? It was they gave me one. What about the Yamaha? What if, how did you choose that? They gave me one. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> I was on a I'm, I'm on a Spectre basis. I'm, I'm a Spectre bass guitar artist. And um, I was on their Facebook page and they were they someone had posted a picture of uh, Paul playing on the roof of the late show a couple of years ago. And they were like, how come he doesn't have any Spectre basses up there? You know, da, 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 da. you know, and I was tempted to write like, well, because Spectre never gave him one. Yeah. You know, all Stuart Specter has to do is like show up at a gig and say, "Hey, man, I've, we've built you a left-handed Specter," and you'd see it in the arsenal. You know that wall. I think the wall five string. They just gave it to him. Again, pure instinct. I don't think this is a guy who thinks like, "Yeah, I'm looking for a bass that's like, I'd like something with active pickups and maybe a rosewood fingerboard and and uh, you know maybe me an ash body." I've heard that those are better. I don't think he he's not thinking in those terms. You know, the famous quote of what kind of strings do you use? And he goes, the long, shiny ones. <laughs> he doesn't know why. He's just he's he's following his muse. You know what I mean? So, again, it's fun to follow which instruments he used. Oh, was he using the 63 Hofner versus the 64 Hofner? Is that a reissue? Was it a lefty that was converted? Was it a right handed bass converted to a left hand? You know, other people can keep tally of all that kind of stuff i'm more interested in the choices that the guy makes musically in the moment where he phrases things when how he waits for the space in the vocal to put the lick in and how he doesn't go for the obvious riff you know all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. it, it's kind of funny that he doesn't you know go out looking for a specific things in a bass, but he has been known to buy historical instruments. He owns Bill Black's stand-up bass um, and right. one of Elvis's guitars. I once interviewed uh, the, the singer Jerry Hadley, who was in Liverpool Oratorio, and uh, sure. Jerry Hadley had, uh, you know, he'd been in a rock band as a kid, and they're working in Paul's studio in Sussex, and Paul hands him a guitar and says, let's just do, you know, Heartbreak Hotel. This is Bill Black's bass. Yeah. And they played the song, and at the end, uh, Jerry Hadley says, I can't believe I just did Heartbreak Hotel with Paul McCartney playing Bill Black's bass. And Paul said, well, you just played yeah. it on Elvis's guitar. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, it's good he didn't tell him before. He would have yeah, I know he would have freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions, guys? Because I have one last one I want to ask, John. No, go ahead. Who do you think are bass players that you feel were more obviously influenced by Paul? Ah. I know, in the show that you were on last time, I know you mentioned a few, and one of them was Joe Jackson's bass player, Graham Maybe. Oh, for sure, yeah. Also you know. a Spectre artist. And I got to tell you, we're just if I can plug the concert for Bangladesh Revisited. Right. Uh, that's going to be happening on Friday, March 13th at the Tillis Center for the Performing Arts. Uh, we've been doing this with Wondrous Stories for the last couple of years. And this is the ninth year. Cast of thousands, including our mutual friend Ed Ryan, mm -hmm. Tommy Williams, Kenny Forgio. And we always bring in a bunch of star guests, as they say in England. Um, Steve Holly's coming back. Um Marshall Crenshaw, but I think, Mar is going to be on. Marshall there. Crenshaw is going to be on, and Graham is going to be playing bass with him. Oh. <laughs> and we're going to be actually doing a song. I won't tell you the name of the song, but I can tell you that it is a Beatles song, 
and Graham's going to be playing bass, and I'm going to be playing fuzz bass. Mm. I won't tell you which song it is, but I, you know, you'll just you'll just have to uh, you know think for yourself. for yourself and figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and when I said to Tommy Williams, I said, "So I'm going to play fuzz bass on this. Who's going to play bass?" He's, "Oh, your Graham will play that." I'm like, "Oh, okay." You know, so yeah, he's definitely. I mean, again, I'm just going by my own study of these records and my own personal opinion. Who the melodic guys are, you know, the the disciples. You know, mm-hmm. Graham's definitely on there. I would say Colin Molding from XTC. Mm. Uh, is another Mike Massaro's from the Smithereens. Why? Why we don't talk about that guy all the time? I, I, I will, I will never understand. Bruce Thomas from Elvis Costello and the Attractions. Another guy, like a direct descendant of the McCartney school, whether he know, whether he knows it or not. In fact, Bruce Thomas tells a story. Bruce Thomas was on the uh, Rock Orchestra sessions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was he. He tells a story about there being a break in the sessions, and he's talking to McCartney, and he says, "You know, I got to, I got to. I've, I've stolen so many lines off of you." And Paul says, "Like, oh yeah, I've stolen a few things off of you as well." And he picks up his bass and starts playing the bass line to "I Don't Want to Go to Chelsea." Wow. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he's definitely. I mean, the the bass lines on this year's model. When I got that record, that was like a key bass record for me. You know, like when there's like an A chord, and the organ riff, and who who would think to go on the bass is to go, and then hold it out for two bars, you know. You know, thinking of constructing bass parts that are functional and solid, but also like unique enough that they stand alone as their own melodies. You know, I'm sure there are so many others who came who, who were you know direct descendants of that. But those those are the guys that I that I think of the most. XTC in particular, you know. In fact, I don't know if you saw the documentary on them on Showtime. Yes, very good. Um, yeah. I love the fact that Andy Partridge is no shame in saying you know every once in a while you get a band that just keeps growing and growing and growing. And I must say that we are the other band that did that. <laughs> <laughs> Really, you don't say. Okay, mm. but he's not wrong. You know, I'm trying to think of anybody else offhand as I as I stare at my CD collection. I mean, I think Sting has a lot of lines. You know, I think that Sting understood yeah. the you know the 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 idea of being functional and interesting. You know, and also they were a band more like Wings in the sense that they were not. They were touring constantly, so those songs were, were being put down, you know, in a hurry, and then they were rushing out onto the road to play them. So there's an energy to those records, those police records, uh, that comes from them, you know, killing it on stage every night. So I, I, I think I think I, I don't know that he's would he would he would consider himself like a disciple of, of McCartney, but definitely he's one of the guys that I connect to that idea of like of being functional but also you know interesting and inventive at the same time getty lee i'm not as familiar with rush i'm kind of rush deficient but i'll take your word for it mm. so i, I many, mean I, there's so I many guys that, that say oh what about getty lee and i and to the point where like i gotta go get some rush albums and learn these learn this music and see what everyone's you know talking about i, I don't think of getty lee and paul mccartney usually together but Getty Lee's awfully melodic as a player. Uh, right. If you just use that as the means to make a comparison, uh, he's somebody that right. uh, you know could you could say probably listened to a lot of what McCartney was doing over the years. Well, yeah, I mean, I think they were the Beatles, so you could not listen. You couldn't not listen to McCartney. You know, it was impossible. You couldn't, you know, there was a period where you you turn on the radio. I mean, the Beatles were everywhere. They 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 were, you know, they changed everything. They had such, you know, they had such an impact. And it's very easy to to take Paul for granted as a bass player. That's the other point that I make. It's easy to overlook his, you know, the fact that he was so inventive because the Beatles were such a phenomenon of in in society in they were like cultural i mean they 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 affected the way everybody dressed the way everyone thought about life 
you know, and I said this in the workshop last year, if all Paul ever did was play the bass for the Beatles, never mind the singing, never mind the songwriting, you know, if all he ever did was play bass, he, he would still, you know, he'd still be a legend, you know? Right. Like, just the bass playing alone it would, would, would have been enough for him to be, you know, to have his place in the Hall of Fame secure, you know? Absolutely. And I left out, right. I, I intentionally left out Ant Whistle, John Ant Whistle, and uh, Jack Bruce and John Paul Jones, because that's the Mount Rushmore to me, is McCartney, Ant Whistle, Jack Bruce, John Paul Jones. So I think of them as being like the architects of, mm-hmm. of bass. But McCartney in particular, just, the, you know, for the for the melodic thing and and being supportive at the same time. Okay. Before we wrap things up, I want to just bring up the concert that you mentioned before, John, of Wondrous Stories. Yeah. For anyone that doesn't know about this, I mentioned this once on the show, but this is called the Concert for Bangladesh Revisited, and this is the ninth year that this is happening. It's actually um, in Brookville, Long Island, at the Tilly Center. They recreate the entire concert for Bangladesh, every song that was played, with the exception of the first you know, the long piece that Ravi Shankar played, but they, they <laughs> substitute that with something else. Like a couple of years ago, they would play within you without you or love you too, but everything else, all the Leon Russell, Bob Dylan, Ringo, Billy Preston, all that music is all played in that show. And that's only part of it. They also do a whole other set of Beatles and solo music. And like John said, they have special guests on. And by the way, this guy that John mentioned, Ed Ryan, most people don't know uh, who he is unless you live in the, the New York area in Long Island. He's a guy that's been a friend of mine <laughs> since the early 80s. I met him working in a record store at Record World on Long Island. I uh, began to realize what a huge Beatle fan he was. And we could talk about anything. We could talk about all the solo music. Little did I know that he lived three blocks away from me and I never knew it. Huh. And when I when I started doing a Beatles show on college radio at WNYT in Old Westbury, which is right near the Tilly Center, by the way, Ed was my co-host. He was with me on the air for a year before oh, wow. I went on my own. And he's an amazing singer, songwriter. Uh, he's this his singing alone is will will blow you away. He usually ends up doing the whole Leon Russell medley. Yeah. But um he's incredible. He really is. And um you go and see this show. It's one of the greatest concerts I've ever been to. I've been to a few of them already. They go on for like over three hours, three and a half hours maybe. You'll be there till eleven thirty at night, <laughs> close to midnight. And um you know, a few years ago, they had Denny Lane and Steve Holly there. They had Gene Cornish from the Rascals there. Yeah. Um, you know, they always have special guests that they invite to the concert. Like you said, um, Marshall Crenshaw, Graham, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and you've been a part of it. And you did a great version of um, Someplace Else. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I was really uh, glad to get that in the set. Yeah, I, I, it's a great uh, it's a great show every year. I mean, you know, that music kind of plays itself. You know, people love that music and um, bringing it alive on stage every every time is just it's very it's something very, very special. And it's it's really taken on a life of its own over the years. And, you know, Kenny Forgione and, and, and uh, you know, he, he runs a really great, uh, great situation there. He, he allows a lot of people to come in and, and, uh, and shine. And, and, and Tommy Williams and, celebrate. and Tom, yeah, Tommy is the as the as the MD. He's got his hands full, kind of, you know, wrangling all those you know cats, mm-hmm. as it were. But you know, I I approached them this year and said, hey man, we never played this one. Can we? You know, I want to play fuzz bass, and they were like, yeah, okay. You know, it's not an easy task, you know, putting on a giant show like that. But last couple of years, I got to say, like from load in to load out tends to go pretty smoothly. Everybody checks their ego at the door and brings their A game and all those other, you know, cliches that we hear about in this business. <laughs> and it's, and it's always a, it's always a fun night, you know, and, and I, and I look forward to it every year. It's a lot of fun. So it's going to be, going to be a good one this time. And not and only then, that, yeah. proceeds actually go to benefit the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. That's right. That's right. So it always goes to uh, cancer research every single year. Yeah. So, it's a great show. Anybody that lives in the New York area, especially in Long Island, should go and see this show. 
the concert for Bangladesh Revisited, which um, is March 13th at the Tilly Center in Brookville. All right. So before we go, you guys want to give your contact information for our listeners? We'll start with Darren. Yeah, you can uh, email me at W, uh, at w yeah, my email address at WFUV, and it's Darren DeVivo, uh, spelled out at, it's spelled out, it's not part of the email address, it's just Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Go to Facebook, like my radio page, which is called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio, and uh, we could be in touch there. And uh, just keep in mind my hours on the air Monday through Thursday nights from 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning and weekends, our HD2 channel, which is called FUV Music, uh, which you can stream on our website, stream on our app, listen to at 90.7 FM HD2. I'm on from 12 noon Saturday to midnight Sunday night. Yes, 36 hours. And uh, and check me out there. And during those 36 hours, Darren doesn't change his clothes. Uh, a A lot of things i don't do during that 36 hours which makes the end of the show even more entertaining so long as it's not 36 hours rolling in pain Ooh, very good oh always need to write that 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 will make a good song lyric i'm gonna write that down and steal that Very fast, Alan. I'm impressed. Mm. That's why I get paid <laughs> okay, the medium Alan, bucks. Okay, Alan, how about you? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> probably the, the easiest way to reach me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my alter ego. You can reach all of us by email at Things We Said Today Radio Show. That's one word. Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. It's at Things We Said Fab. Um, and we also have a Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. So that's me. Okay. And we'll save John, the best for last. Oh, thanks. As, as far as me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email, which is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Don't forget, I have a Beatles trivia and games page where every single week you can win one of nine incredible prizes like the brand new Blu-ray for Harry Nilsson's uh, TV special, animated special, The Point, with a lot of bonus features on there. There's all kinds of great prizes, books from Ken Womack and Kid O'Toole and Ken Mansfield. You can win all that on the website. And um, speaking of Kid O'Toole, Next Monday night, which is March the 9th, will be our next Talk More Talk solo Beatle video cast. It's at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We'll be discussing the first three solo singles from John Lennon, meaning a piece of chance, uh, the song that uh, Alan was just referencing and called Turkey, and Instant Karma. And that'll be with Kid O'Toole, Mean Mr. Mayo, and Tom Hunyadi of the Two Legs Solo Paul McCartney podcast. Mm. And um, I do believe that's it. And so before we uh, hear your contact information, John, yeah. let's remind everybody that you will be at the fest. Now, the fest itself runs March 27th to the 29th, but like you said, you'll be there on the Saturday. Yep, 27, March 27, 28, 29 at the Hyatt Regency in Jersey City. Right. And I believe and the, the website is thefest.com. Correct. You click, on, you click on there, and it's, it says New York Metro Fest, March 27th through 29th. And you scroll down, and I think you will eventually see my picture in the uh, thing of people appearing there. They have a very nice picture of me taken from, the, from last year's fest, actually. Mm-hmm. So there we are. Okay. <laughs> And you were telling me earlier you have a new EP out? I just released a new uh, digital-only EP. It's called Hashtag Going Direct. Um, it, was, it was released last year on, I want to say, November 17th. There had been a pretty, pretty nasty Mercury retrograde for about a month. And I had these four songs that were just demanding to be released a lot of my songs tend to sit on hard drives for like months and months years sometimes these four 
just formed like a, a coalition. They formed like a, a super PAC, and they were like, "You're recording us, and you're putting us out now." And I decided to release them on the day that Mercury went direct. And if you don't know what Mercury retrograde and Mercury going direct are about, um, just you know, as Bootsy Collins would say, Google it, baby. So, <laughs> uh, so the the EP is called Hashtag Going Direct, and it's four songs. Uh, they are available for free as a download from my website, which is johnmontagna.com, uh, where you can also go to keep up with all of my shows. You can download all of my music. In fact, all, all of my solo albums are on the website. You can purchase downloads there. You can stream them. The hashtag Going Direct and Late to the Party, uh, which is my last album before that. That came out in 2016. That is also free. Uh, as a download all my other solo albums are up there for purchase or for streaming from the website johnmontagna.com uh the facebook page is john montagna fans i believe i came up with a really stupid name back in the day and you can't they don't let you change it twitter is at john mon j-o-n-m-o-n uh, the Instagram is John Montagna. the youtube channel is uh youtube.com slash john montagna music and um, if you drop me a line at the website, you go to johnmontagna.com, you go to contact, and you um, you sign up for the mailing list, you'll get a free download of my song Brick Oven Pizza, Beer and Wine. Uh, we'll get emailed directly to your, uh, to your email address when you sign up for the mailing list. So I'm trying to get more regular emails out from the website with, uh, with news and all that, all that other mother jazz, as they say. <laughs> okay, it's time to... It's time to check out all your music. Yeah, and, and yes, I like free. I like free. Free. Well, I know. Well, I'm I'm starting to find that out to my detriment. That people uh, <laughs> yeah. people like free. Well, and also because it's like you know, I I would rather I I think about the '90s, right, where you would make a demo and you'd give it out to people. You make you go in the studio, you make your demo, you print up cassettes, and you hand them out to everybody, and everybody knows your songs, and that just seemed like a much more reasonable model than like begging people to buy your stuff mm. certainly better than printing up a thousand cds and having them you know sitting in a storage space somewhere so i just said you know i'm just going to put the stuff up so they can have it so people know the songs, so that when my band plays out somewhere they they they've heard the songs already so that's that right i should also mention that um both darren and i will be at the fest cool. and we're going to be on a few panels, I'm sure one of them will be together, that hasn't been, the schedule hasn't been made up yet, but uh, as soon as we know, we'll let you guys know. I can't say this. I can't say this. We definitely will be doing a Things We Said Today panel, Ken. Oh, okay. It's in the men's room on the second floor. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Of course, we get the third room. No. Uh, But we definitely will be doing a Things We Said Today and uh, I was asked if we would be recording it as a show, so we've got things to talk about once this one ends. But we will okay. get the fest, and there'll be a talk more talk panel, which <laughs> looks like it will be on Saturday. So <laughs> we'll all be together. We all stand together. There you go. Mm. <laughs> no, Alan gets the Alan gets the points for the cold turkey reference. Oh, that that <laughs> yeah. can be top. That was better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. This has been tremendous. Thank you, John, for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And for Alan Cozen, Darren DeVivo, and John Montagna, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time. (laughs) 